of something. But God saw fit to have you be here, and for that, we are grateful. Amen. Hallelujah. Indeed, we're going to go right into the word that God has for us. Those that have been with me for a while, you know that we're in the midst of a series on deliverance. You also know uh, that I'm usually setting everything up. But how many of you know that God is good? Amen. Truly, he is good all the time. And I'm so thankful and so blessed that that we're, we're progressing. Amen. I had to come in and move no tables around. I had to come in and and, and, and put no TV up. The TV's where it's supposed to be. Amen. Can everybody see it? Everybody can see y'all right? Praise God. Praise God. So, so we're in the midst of our series on deliverance today. And the series, for those that are here, just please indulge me for just a few minutes to get everybody else up to speed. It's a series that we've started on the whole uh, topic of deliverance. What happens oftentimes is that people get so spooked out by the whole concept of deliverance. People kind of kind of kind of are kind of staying clear of it. They're a little leery of it because they're like, there must be something, some trickery to it. There must be some 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 hocus pocus to it. There's not. There's very much a spiritual dynamic at play. And that spiritual dynamic that's at play is designed to help us grow and to help us become better. And what we've been talking about through this series as we've gone through the first seven lessons, we've talked about what deliverance is and deliverance and a word is rescue. Each and every one of us, whether we want to admit it or not, whether we believe it or not, at some point in time, because we were outside of our relationship with Jesus Christ, we needed to be rescued. Amen. We needed to be found where we were because the battle had overtaken us and we were in a state where we could be utterly destroyed. But by the Lord's mercy, we were not consumed. And at some point, our spiritual eyes were opened so that we said yes to Jesus. And that was a glorious day. But how many here know that saying yes to Jesus is not the end, it's just the beginning, amen? So what happens is that when we say yes to Jesus, we realize now that we're part of the blessed, we're part of the beloved, which is Jesus Christ. And as such, we get all the benefits, rights, and privileges that come with that because now we're family. And because we're family, the enemy who is Satan, he can't curse what God has blessed because all he has the capacity to do is corrupt and pervert and disrupt. That's all he can do. So since he knows he can't outright curse us, but his desire is to utterly destroy us, he came up with a while, which is from the Greek word methodia, which is like a method. His method is if he can put enough pressure on us in different areas of our lives and get us so out of sorts in different areas of our lives that we lose focus of what we're supposed to keep our focus on, which is Christ, he can then get us to do the dirty work that he can't do because if he gets us frustrated enough and if he gets us under enough pressure and he gets us bound enough, what he desires us to do is begin to curse what God has blessed, which is us. So when we begin to speak curses over ourselves, what we've done is we've given the enemy legal access in the spirit realm to come in because we've invited him in. I use the example a few weeks back. If somebody's at your door and they ring your bell and you open the door and you say hello and they say, say hello, it's usually customary for you being the owner of the house to invite the guest in. So if you don't invite the guest in, y'all going to be standing at the door looking at each other till somebody either says, are you going to let me in? Or until you say, yeah, come on in. Well, what happens is that what we do, we invite the enemy in every time we allow sin to come into our lives to the point where we begin to fall into agreement with it. And each time we fall into agreement with sin, we give the enemy more and more access to our lives to the point where we become overwhelmed and we need help or we need to be rescued, which is what deliverance is. If deliverance is simply taking the word of God and reversing the curses that we've spoken onto ourselves that the enemy's acted upon. And as we've looked at this, we've looked at the different areas of, um, categories of things that get us to the point of needing deliverance. We've looked at how we get in trouble with our eyes. We've looked at how we get in trouble with our minds and with our mouths. We looked at the process of becoming delivered. We looked at over the past two weeks, um, the different keys of how to maintain your deliverance. And tonight, as we come to lesson eight, which Holy Spirit, I believe is prompting to be the last lesson in this series, we're going to talk about something that we talked about earlier in this series. And we're going to talk about an extreme makeover. 
Anybody who's seen the show Extreme Makeover before, you've probably seen it. And you know they got all different versions of it. Well, tonight we're going to go through an episode of Extreme Makeover Temple Edition. Amen. How many know when I say Temple Edition, what, what I'm talking about? What's the temple that we're talking about? Right. Us. We're the temple, right? That's right. We're the temple. Word lets us know that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. So when I say Extreme Makeover Temple Edition, we can't go through this gigantic life changing and transforming transformation in the spirit realm, which equips us to begin to transform everything around us in our natural lives and not transform the temple that we live in. Who, who here, if you were blessed to win the lottery or blessed with a, a gigantic sum of money, if you own a home, wouldn't make sure that your home is redone? I think we all would. Because the home is where we spend most of our time. Amen. Our home is where we spend most of our downtime. Most of our time where if we had an enemy, we would be viewed as most vulnerable because we put our guards down at home. Right. So when we look at this and we look at the whole premise of home and the significance of home, we want to make sure that we understand our rallying cry. And our rallying cry is up there on the screen. Those have not been with us before. If you remember nothing else from this series, please remember John 8 and 36, and which says, so if the sun makes you free, then you are unquestionably free. Or whom the sun sets free is free indeed. Amen. Which means if nothing else, you know that without question, you've been set free without question. Your life has been changed without question. Everything about you is brand new because the word says that he makes all things new, including us once we say yes to Christ. So knowing that and understanding that, Jesus wanted to make it crystal clear that it's only half the battle to have everything take place all around you and you not take care of home. I was always taught when I grow up, when I was growing up, that you you take care of home first. Amen. And so often what happens is that we forget, particularly in the spirit realm, to take care of home. So let's talk about this parable, quick story that Jesus told. If you look at Matthew 12, verses 43 to 45, it's up on the screen back there. I'll read it from here. He said, when an unclean spirit goes out of a man, that's through deliverance. He, the spirit, goes through dry places seeking rest and finds none. Then he says, I'll return to my house from which I came. And when he comes, he finds it empty, swept, and put in order. Here's a problem. What's missing in that description? Furniture, right? Character, right? Furniture that we get and put in a place from the pictures on the walls to the pieces of furniture in the house, even to the accessories that put, we put on the tables and around the chairs, they all speak to our character. Amen. They speak to our character. And it's what makes the place that we call home just that, our home. Because it's designed for our comfort. It's designed for our benefit. It's designed to get and keep us in a state where we can be maintained and we can be left in a place and a space to be productive in other areas of our lives. So when deliverance comes to us, the unspeak, unclean spirit that's, that goes out, because it has to, because it's trespassing, it goes out and it goes around all the dry places. And since it ain't got nowhere to live because it came and kind of squatted in us because it was invited in and it shouldn't have been with our actions. It comes back. And how many people know the whole premise of what a squatter does? What a squatter does, it finds a place that's empty. It ain't got to be the best looking place as long as there ain't nothing in there. And there's nothing in there that identifies that this place belongs to somebody. As long as there's no character in there. And I want you all to remember that word because we're going to come back to it. As long as there's no character in there, they're like, well, heck, if ain't no character in there, I'm just going to do what I got to do, slide on in. I don't need no electricity. I'll get some candles. I, I don't need no heat. I got a blanket. I can put a two by four up. Next thing you know, they in there squatting. And the crazy part about it is I don't know the laws here in Wisconsin well because I'm originally from Illinois. But I know in Illinois, there's a thing called squatter's rights, where if you squat in a place long enough, you fooled around and gotten rights. And in some cases, that's right, Pastor. It's viewed in the legal system as yours. You've now taken it 
catch this, you've taken it as a result of the owner defaulting and giving up their rights to ownership. How'd they give up their rights to ownership? They give up their rights to ownership because they didn't properly maintain it. They didn't make sure the taxes were paid. They didn't make sure that it was properly taken care of. They didn't make sure that it was secure it was supposed to. They left it pretty much open and it became open season for the random individual that comes along. So what the random individual that comes along has done is now taken a property that at one point in time may have had a $100,000, $200,000, $300,000 value or even more and gotten it for nothing. But in the process, they've devalued it to the point where now it's viewed as an eyesore. Now it's viewed as something that people don't want around. And if you take that and move that to the spirit realm, what Christ is saying is you're one of one. You were created in my image and in my likeness. You were fearfully and wonderfully made. Before you were twinkling in your mom and dad's eye, I knew you. Something that priceless and something that precious and something that rare has gotten caught up with some things that are not of me and deliverance had to take place. And praise, praise God, you're delivered. But since you have no character in the place, you're in jeopardy of giving up your rights to the place and everything that's associated with it by allowing the enemy to come back in and take up residence by squatting again. And the crazy part about it is, as Jesus goes on, he finds it empty, swept, and put in order. Then he goes and takes with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself. So when he comes back, he ain't coming back by himself. He ain't coming back by himself because, like, it's a whole lot of room up in here. That heart is cold and that heart is empty. So not only am I going to come in, but I'm going to bring uh, selfishness and, 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 and carelessness with me. That brain is empty. So I'm going to bring uh, uh, lust and jealousy with me, too. And before you know it, you find an individual can find themselves seven times worse from a state standpoint than they were at first. And that's what Jesus is talking about, because when I read this and I read the last portion of this, the, the scripture, it gave me chills to my spirit. It says, so shall it be with this wicked generation. And it's wild because if you go and really study deep enough, many of these scriptures are written in different tenses. And, and some of these, some scriptures written in something that's called the aortist imperative tense, which in plain English is something that's a, it's a tense that you should be passionate about. Something that was said passionately, and it remains passionate because it's always appropriate. This passage right here, for me, is an aortist imperative thing. So shall it be with this wicked generation. That's what's happening out there. There are people that are out there that are in even worse state now than they were at one time before. And the, and, the, and the thing that blows my mind about it is that as I talk to some of these people, many of them understand and know who Christ is. They have a foundation in the church. They have a foundation. They had a relationship with Christ. But like I said earlier, at some point, somehow, some way, something, someone, somewhere, pull them away. Backsliding took place to the point where they just decided, you know what, it's not even worth it. Or let me rephrase. They didn't decide. The enemy got it into their mind and they fell into agreement with the lie that they've done too much, that you've fallen away too far, that God could never love you because all of those are lies of the enemy. Those have been with us. That we, we, we had a, a two parts uh, a lesson called How Bad Do You Want It? That's what deliverance is all about. How bad do you want it? That's a question we have to ask ourselves every single day. How bad do you want to stay free? How bad do you want to maintain the liberty that you have? Because in order to maintain that liberty, we've got to meet the condition. The word says where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Yet many times the enemy brings things that look pretty convincing that the spirit of the Lord is not there. And God is saying uh, th through, through his son, Jesus Christ, that we've got to be mindful and allow character to fill that space. But not just any character to fill that space. We need God's character to fill that space. 
Does that mean that we stop being individuals? Absolutely not, because each of us were created to be one of one. But as we continue to be that one of one that God created us to be, we cannot and should not ever forget from whence we came. We should never forget that we belong to God. We should never forget that we've been placed back in right standing in the family through the sacrifice and love of Jesus Christ. And as such, we've got to be always mindful that we've got work to do. We got work to do because as our temple is cleaned, we've got to strive to fill, to fill it. Amen. Jesus paid it all. And he paid it all so that we would not have an eternal debt. Deliverance came as a result of what he did because our freedom is paid for. It's yours free and clear. But now you got to furnish it. You got to put your spin on my character in it. This is why this is so important. That's why it's got to be an extreme makeover. So you may ask the question, Pastor, what do I fill my temple with after my deliverance? Okay, I'm set free now. I got it. When the sun sets free, that's me. I'm the sun. It's free indeed. I'm unquestionably free. Praise God. Hallelujah. I'm free. But now what? You ever feel that way? Okay, God, I'm past that now what? In fact, let me even bring it out of the spirit realm, put it in the natural realm. I remember much younger in my life, I met a man who was struggling with alcohol. And it was my first exposure, honestly, to the whole premise of the 12-step program being lined up with the word. And I met this guy literally driving around. I was working. I was doing radio sales. I met this guy. The Holy Spirit led me to him, and we just began to talk. And he said, man, I, I'm really trying to get my life together. I don't want to be in this state. I'm, 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 I feel like I'm trapped in alcohol. I'm like, you're never trapped in anything, brother, because the word says whom the son sets free is free indeed. He's like, okay, but how do I get free? Because this bond, this bond seems to be so strong, it feels like I can't break it. I said, well, I, and as I said, well, Holy Spirit said, go to the bookstore. I'm going to show you a book to buy. I said, I don't have the answer for you today, but by faith, I'm going to believe I'm going to see you here next time I'm over here. And when I do, I'm going to have something for you. And I went to the bookstore and Holy Spirit led me to a book. I think I still have the word book. Led me to a book on the 12-step program, the spiritual aspect of it and looking at the dynamics behind it. And as I began to look through it, I thought about him the whole time. So when I saw him, I gave him a copy of it. I said, here's how we stay free. The biggest and first and foremost thing we have to remember is that we've got to admit, we got to be in a constant state of admission because admission is the first step to recovery. Those that have been with us, they know what admission does is it brings light into the situation and the enemy thrives in the darkness. He is totally ineffective in the light. So the way we keep the enemy muted is to keep him in a position where he's got to come to the light to get us. But what happens is sin tries to draw us to the dark. But when we get set free and when we get to living, we've got to admit, God, I don't have what it takes to stay free. I don't have the spiritual eye that I need to place your character in this place as it needs to be. There's some things that I need to get from you. When you go to the grocery store and you go to the fruit section and you go to the vegetable section, it has a name, and it's not fruits and vegetables. Anybody know what that name is? What department that is? What was that? That's right. It's called a produce department. Why is it called a produce department? It's called a produce department because the fruit that you see and the vegetables that you see are a testament to the work that the people that grew it put into it to get it into that state. So when we think about what God desires us to exhibit. He desires us to exhibit two things. He desires us to exhibit the power of Holy Spirit and he desires us to exhibit the fruit of Holy Spirit. And you can't have one and not have the other if you're, not, if you're doing it right. Because if you're doing it right and walking in the fullness of the first thing we're going to talk about, which is the power, the byproduct of putting the work in it's going to bring about an exhibition of God's character. That's why I said, remember that character, that word character. That's where the fruit comes from. 
The fruit is Christ's character. The power is the discipline that Christ had to walk in. And as we walk in that discipline, that discipline is critical for us to do so much. Because throughout this whole series, we've been talking about the word methodia, which is where wiles came from. Wiles is the Greek word methodia, which is method. There's a method to the enemy's madness. And everything we've done up to this point has been designed to get us out of the grasp of the methodia. But what we're going to talk about tonight is what it takes to ultimately destroy the methodia because it is available to us. Amen. So when we look at 1 Corinthians, the 12th chapter, verses 7 through 11, is everybody with me still? Everybody's with me? Any questions anybody have? Everybody okay? Anybody on, 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 on Zoom? Any questions? Is everybody okay? 1 Corinthians. Mm -hmm. 1 Corinthians, the 12th chapter, verses 7 through 11. And what you'll find written there reads in this fashion. But the manifestation of the spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the spirit. To another, the word of knowledge through the same spirit. To another, faith by the same spirit. To another, gifts of healings by the same spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy to another discerning of spirits, to another different kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. But one and the same spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. So let's unpack that a little bit. What that's basically saying is, when it's referred to the spirit, it's referring to Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit is the third person of the Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, God, the Holy Spirit. Everybody with me so far? Okay. Holy Spirit, and you keep hearing me say Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit is a person. It's an, it's an, it's an entity. It's, it's a, a living, breathing being. That's why many times you hear Holy Spirit referred to as him. Here. The same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. So what we have to remember is the first lie we're dispelling. Well, you and this all alone, we're never alone because Holy Spirit is with us. We're never alone because Jesus let us know as it pertains to the Great Commission, as long as we're fulfilling the Great Commission and striving to do so, I'll be with you always. I'll be with you in all of your ways, even until the end of the age. That means when you're getting it right, I'm with you. When you're getting it wrong, I'm with you. I'm not beating you over the head when you're getting it wrong. I'm not puffing you with your head up too big when you're getting it right. I'm walking with you all the way. When I was little and I was growing up, there was a poem that, that struck me before I even understood it called Footprints. I'm sure you all have heard it. I'm sure you all have seen it. And I think about it every time when, it, when I feel like I'm by myself. And I'm that person. You're saying, Lord, I, I, I love you, but why is it that in the toughest times, I see only one set of footprints? Did you leave me? That's right, Pastor. He said, my son, I love you too much for that. It's in them times that I was carrying you. But what the enemy tries to do is he tries to get us to forget that we're not alone. And this is why it's critical for us to understand the significance of these nine gifts. Nine is the number of birth. It's a number of birth and it's a number of new life. And as we realize and understand the magnitude of these nine gifts in our lives, it gives us a capacity to birth a whole new dimension of life that God desires us to live and walk in. Because individually, these nine gifts of the spirit are significant because they are, and I want everybody to remember this phrase, the active nemesis. I want you to remember that. If you're taking notes, please write it down. I put the definition in the sentence up there. Active nemesis, what that means, what a nemesis is, is it's an inescapable agent of the downfall of something. And for us, this is the payoff for us from Methodia in lesson one. The wiles of the enemy are ultimately destroyed by the nine gifts of the spirit. 
And they're ultimately destroyed by the nine gifts of the spirit because the nine gifts of the spirit or the, 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 the power of God, the power that Christ walked in once he was filled with the Holy Spirit after John the Baptist baptized him in the Jordan River, when the Holy Spirit ascended from heaven like a dove, this is what he imparted. He gave Jesus the unilateral authority and power to overcome any and every method that the enemy would try to bring into his life. And what, the, what, what God desires us to understand is that as we walk by faith in him and as we allow Holy Spirit to lead and guide us, we too have the capacity to receive that same measure of power so that we can become part of the inescapable agent that brings about the downfall of the wiles of the enemy in our own lives. Because what that does is it shuts down all of his activity. It renders him absolutely ineffective. Think about Superman. In the, in the, in the shows, they would shoot nuclear warheads at him. They would send any and everything at him. And he just laughed at it. That was the most powerful things that man had. He would just laugh at it, brush it off. Why? Because the power that he operated in was so much more superior than what man thought was the most powerful thing that he created. With the enemy, it works the same way in the spirit realm. The enemy can throw all of his attacks. He'll send all of his strategies. He'll send all of his demons and imps. But once we realize the power that we tap into, when we say yes to God, and once we realize the power that's at our disposal, as we truly allow God to sit on the throne of our hearts and truly have his way, and let Holy Spirit truly have his way to lead us and to guide us and to fill us and bring us into all truth, man, the enemy doesn't stand a chance. And what that does, that neutralizes every attack that the enemy seeks to bring into our lives. What does that look like on an individual level? What that looks like is you start having conversations that people might think that you are crazy. You start having conversations with a, with, with a person that people can't see. Sometimes people hear you with those conversations. Other times they might see your mouth moving, but they're looking at you. And the enemy will try to make you think, well, they're looking at you because you're crazy. No, that's not what they're doing. They're looking at you because there's something different about you. And though initially they might be judging you, Holy Spirit, even in that moment, has the capacity to be at work. If our prayer is, Holy Spirit, use me as you will. Have your way that you activate every aspect of who I am in my life. You activate every aspect of power that you put in my life. You activate the full complement and scope of dunamis in my life. So that I can be everything that you call me to be and everything that you created me to be. And because Holy Spirit can see around corners and through walls that we can't, he'll put us in position. Well, unbeknownst to us, he'll use us to make a difference in the lives of other people. And in the process of using us to make a difference in the lives of other people, God is blessing us by our willingness to yield ourselves to him so that he can use us. Does that make sense? But often the thing that trips us up from that is us. Fear. One of those things that the enemy seeks to try to bring in when nothing else works. Well, you know if you try that, you're going to fail because, and he'll try to give you reasoning. But this is why we got to remember, if any individual be in Christ, be in Christ rather he's a new creature, old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. That means I literally have a new walk, have a new talk, have a new mindset, have a new thought process. Because instead of running everything through the stinking thinking of my flesh, I'm running everything through my renewed mind of being that new creature. And in doing that, it gives me a new perspective, which means it's going to have me speak in a different way that's going to represent the one that's the driving force in my life. Because as we become the ambassadors for Christ that he's calling us to become, 
he then begins to take our speech and begins to take our thoughts and begins to take our action and change them. And he begins to help us see new dimensions of ourselves that we didn't even recognize. I tell I tell people this all the time, especially when I'm, when I'm in the audience of, of, of guys that when I, I met my wife, I found myself you know, saying stuff that my mind is like, what are you doing? I'm being honest and being true because this is something that's totally different. I've never been in this space before. It's almost like something on the inside is compelling me to do something different. When you fall in love with Jesus and Holy Spirit truly takes control of your life, it compels you to function differently. You can't walk the same way you did. You can't talk the same way you did. And that's by divine design because we're in warfare. And the enemy would love nothing more than to come back and infiltrate the camp that is your temple. But that won't happen if his character is in play in your life. If the power of Holy Spirit is active in your life, there's no way that your life can be the same. You shouldn't want it to be the same. Amen. We should want our lives to be different. And each of us are representatives of the body of Christ and even more so the gifts were given to the church. Because it's designed to, the gifts are designed to build the church up so that it can stand in victory against the enemy because the enemy is trying to tear the church down in the same way. We've all seen what's been happening in the church this year. We've all seen it. Many, many prophets prophesied as, as 2024 was coming in that 2024 was the year of exposure, that this was going to be exposed, that, that was going to be exposed. I, I'm like, okay, you know what? I'm just going to watch. I'm not, I'm, I don't judge another man or woman's gift. I don't question. I, I'll wait and see how it lines up with the reality. And yes, things have happened so that individuals that we thought were in one standing, we find them in a very different standing, have occurred. They have occurred. If it doesn't force me or prompt me to judge that person to jump on or off any bandwagon, but what it does is it turns my spirit man back to when that word came forth and lets me know that the word is true. Yet again, one of the power dynamics of the spirit and it's designed to help the church see and to help us as members of the body understand that the enemy's job on that large scale is the same job that he tries to put into play on a smaller scale which is us he knows that the church is blessed because Jesus Christ ordained it as such he said when Peter realized who he was which incidentally it changed his name from Simon to Peter to show the magnitude of the transition that be uh, upon this rock, meaning the revelation of what you just said, who I am, I'm building my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. At no point did you hear Jesus say that it won't try. That mean it won't try, but it's not going to prevail. But what the enemy's banking on is the noise that you hear, the swords that you hear clattering, the, the, the angry mob that you hear coming, all the stuff that's happening. Let me put it in real terms. The fact that you reach in your pocket and you got a bill due and there's nothing in there but lint. The fact that you're, 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 you're coughing, but you're still saying by his stripes I'm healed. The fact that you're heartbroken, but God is saying I have this for you. Those are the false evidences that appear real and the enemy's trying to see, okay, if I can just get you to fall in agreement with this, I got you. It's the same formula that he tried with Jesus when he tempted him in the desert right after he was hungry. When he was hungry, he came back from being on fast 40 days, 40 nights. He was hungry. That's the low-hanging fruit. He's like, if I can get you on a low-hanging fruit, I got you. Because, again, it's about method. I don't have to have all of you. If I can get my hook into you right there, I got you. And the sad part about it is so many people have fallen prey to that. So many churches have fallen prey to that. But God is calling us now that he's brought deliverance and is in the process of bringing deliverance. He's calling us to walk in deliverance and to have our spiritual eyes wide open and understand that this is the same thing. I've seen this movie before. This is just a sequel. Because now he's like, I'm trying to come for the church. But what we got to do is we got to remember that the nine gifts were given to us to help us ultimately shut down all the methods that the enemy is seeking to bring against the church that's making it ineffective. That's why there are so many people that don't even look to the church for support today. Because they're saying, I see the same corruption in the church that I see out here. 
And if that's the case, why should I turn to the church? Because I can do bad by myself and it don't cost me no money. I'm just keeping it real. But the response should be the activation of the power of the spirit in your life. Because when the power of the spirit is activated in your life, you become a living, breathing, walking, talking witness of when the word talks about that we're a, a, a holy nation. We're a royal priesthood. We're a peculiar people. We don't function like everybody else. These examples that are up there, these are examples of the Spirit's power at work. And if you look at each one of them, they're all contained in one book of the Bible. And what book is that? It's up there. What book is that? The book of Acts, right? Acts. Each one of the scriptures. The book of Acts. I call it the book of action. That's the book where after the Holy Spirit fell, everybody scattered and started doing what God had called them to do. And, the, and, and, the, and, and as they did it, if you go back and read through it, you'll see before it starts taking snapshots of what's going on, it'll get the main headline. And the main headline was something happened in the upper room about 50 days after Jesus died and rose. Something came down seemingly from heaven like, like, like cloven tongues of fire and it began to rest on folks and they started to, to speak in other languages. They started speaking in ways they'd never spoken before. They started doing things they had never done before. And they started spilling out in the street and they, they kept all things common and they all stayed on the same accord because they knew that in unity there was strength. And as they did that and broke bread together and went from house to house keeping all things common, it said souls were added by the thousands daily. And we wonder why the church is not effective today because we've gotten so comfortable in our little corner of our four and no more that we forget that in unity, there's strength. So when the world sees us in our corners, our four and no more, they're like, well, heck, I, I got, I'm already in a corner. So what do I need to come to your corner for? For you to beg me for this, for you to beg me for that. But again, that's the enemy's thinking. And what's happened is the church has fallen prey to it. But what God is doing is he's calling us back to the power source. Because when we walk in the power source, stuff like this happens. You know, the gift of healing will come forth. And we'll have situations like we had at the gate, beautiful. Words of wisdom and knowledge will come forth and change somebody's life and usher them into their ministry. Because Saul, just so you know, if you didn't know, I'm sure everybody here did. Saul was who Paul was before he became Paul. And Saul was knocked off his beast because he was on his way to go do some damage to the Christians. And it took Ananias, a man that was filled with faith and filled with the spirit, to be obedient to God. Because if you read the story, you see that initially Ananias was like, mm, I don't know about that because he's the one trying to take us out. But God said, and, and Holy Spirit ministered to him, I'm paraphrasing, of course, it's okay because I have him in a place now. Where if you do what I've empowered you to do, it's going to change his life. When we begin to realize that if we do what God has empowered us to do, whether it's a word of wisdom and knowledge, whether it's laying hands on the sick and they recover, whether it's walking in discernment, whatever it is, as far as that, those power gifts, we're in a position where God can use us and there's no way our lives will ever be the same. And we should never want our lives to be the same because we know what we came from, amen? Deliverance is part of our overarching story, our story arc, if you will. Deliverance is designed to help us have even more in our spiritual resume to offer as part of our testimony. And story arcs are popular in all kinds of movies because they're designed to stretch across many, many movies. And, 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 and our story arc in the spirit realm is designed to stretch over many, many different seasons of our lives. And each of us have gone through seasons of our lives. And as we go through the seasons of our lives, what happens is we sow seed in each one of those seasons. We sow good seed. We sow bad seed. But what can happen is as we allow God to be God, as that bad seed comes, he'll begin to move in a supernatural way to minimize the harvest so that it doesn't harm us or harm anybody else to the degree that it could. 
In some cases, his, 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 his mercy will get rid of it all together. But in other cases, his grace is sufficient to bring us and those we love through it with us so it does not harm us and overtake us. And that's because we walk in the power that God has given us in the spirit. Because as we walk in the power that God has given us in the spirit and we learn how to wield that power, truly wield that power in a way that we need to wield that power. We then begin to have a byproduct, which we talked about earlier. We begin to have some produce. We begin to have some stuff in our spiritual produce department that people can begin to see. And they can begin to sample. And they can begin to taste. When the word says, taste and see that the Lord is good. We have something that somebody can come and get. If you go, when we when you go to state fair, I don't know if they do it as much here. I know in Illinois they do it a lot. They, they, they have the cattle and everything, but they also have like a section, like a produce section people bring their stuff. They, they tomatoes, their lettuce, their corn, this, that. All that stuff gets judged. And they're looking for freshness. They're looking for size. They're looking for color. All the, to, to, the best of the best. And because we serve the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, that's how we should function. So just like there was a tick list of the PowerPoints that we should have in our lives, we also need to have the, the character of God. Remember, I talked about character. Because there's certain things you got to have in the house. you got to have a furnace. you you got to have sinks. you got to have running water. you got to have that stuff. But in having the sinks and having the toilets and stuff like that, you can get the cheap ones that you can be plunged to help you get stuff down. Or you can get the top of the line was where you just look at it long enough and it just does what it needs to do. God wants us to realize that in him there is no failure because we're created top of the line. We were created by his hand. There is no failure in God. But the enemy tries to get us to sell ourselves and God short. And when we do that, what happens is our fruit begins to suffer. Because we're not doing the work that we need to do at the level that God desires us to do it. And no, it's not a work-based phenomenon. But God blesses us and empowers us and equips us so that as he wills, he stirs up the gifts that he's placed in us. And many times when he stirs those gifts up in us, it's not at the most convenient time. Might not be between 9 and 5 on Monday through Friday. Might be Saturday night at 2 o'clock in the morning in January. You might say you need to drive over to the north side if you live on the south side or drive over to the south side if you live on the north side. And I don't mean drive over to West Dallas or drive up to Grafton. I mean drive over to uh, 16th and National or drive over to, to 8th and Capitol or drive over to 27th and Atkinson. I have somebody over there for you that I need you to deliver a word to. I have somebody over there for you that I need you to lay hands on. Somebody's going to call you and need prayer, and I want you to go over there. It leaves you on, well, Lord, me? Yes, you. Well, why me? Why not you? You're just as qualified as the next man or woman because you're mine. I know you by name. I know what I put in you. Because this is first and foremost designed to activate the power that I place in you that you've now claimed. It's time for me to stir them gifts up in you. And what happens is as that happens, we begin to see Galatians 5, 22 and 23 begin to come forth in our lives. And what it says is, but the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such there is no law. What's the first thing you notice between the first Corinthians passage and the Galatians passage? They each got nine of them, right? Nine power points, nine, nine points of power for the spirit, nine fruit of the spirit. Pastor, what does that mean? That means that each power point gives you the capacity to create a measure of fruit. And if you like me and you like stuff like pineapple orange juice and banana strawberry it is, you fool around and start mixing them fruits together, you get something that's even better. Again, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. And so often we miss out on the blessing that God has created and designed us to be because we don't allow God to fully have complete control. And when we start allowing God not to have full and complete control at all times, we're leaving ourselves open for the enemy. Remember what I said from the beginning. He's going to come back and look in the window. If he sees 
our character, which is the character of God, all over the place, he knows he can't come back in. But if he sees it swept and empty, oh, that's a space I might be able to come in. If he sees that our uh, um, um, heart is still empty, I might be able to slide in there with some selfishness. If he sees that our mind is still empty, he might be able to slide in there and do this or do that. We've got to be mindful at all times. We've got to ever be watchful and ever be vigilant because we have to understand that demons are the exact opposite in character to Jesus. They're the exact opposite. You know the other word, another word for exact opposite, if it gets crucial enough, we looked at it earlier. Demons are the nemesis of Christ's character, but they're not a nemesis to Christ because Christ is victorious. If we're not careful, they can become a nemesis to us. They can become our downfall because there's no failure in God, but they can become a downfall to us if we allow the enemy to have that measure of control. Pastor, how do you stop it? You stop it by remembering how you're created. You're created in the image and likeness of God. And remember how your daddy functions. Here in the sanctuary, we're all men here. So whether we believe it or not, at some point in time, provided he was available, I'm not asking to know anybody's story. My first male role model was my dad. He was. He remained that throughout his life. And because of that, I wanted to walk like my dad. I wanted to talk like my dad. I want to do everything like my dad. Because in my mind, in my eyes, my dad could do no wrong. Of course, because my dad was a man, yes, as we all have, we all are fallible. But how much more do we have a heavenly father who truly is infallible? who's perfect in all of his ways, like the song says, he truly is a good, good father to us. How much more should we want to be like our good, good father? And being that way, we can speak just as our father spoke and things happen because our words carry weight. The word tells us that life and death are in the power of the tongue. We have the capacity to not only dictate the measure of fruit that comes forth, but to dictate the magnitude of how much it comes for. How? By being mindful of what we say. How? By staying in lockstep with Holy Spirit and on the power side. Because if we stay in lockstep with Holy Spirit with the power points, when it comes to the fruit, the fruit is the character of Christ. The power points are the discipline of Christ. The fruit is the byproduct, which is the character of Christ. The PowerPoints is what Christ did constantly as Holy Spirit stirred him up. The fruit is what happened as a result of what Christ did as Holy Spirit stirred him up. And that byproduct was a blessing to everybody that received. And in return, they took it and were a blessing to somebody else. Because of Christ's selfless love, we're here to demonstrate that love. Because of Christ's peace under fire, we're now here to demonstrate that peace of God that passes all understanding. Because when we do that, it keeps our hearts and our minds through Christ Jesus. We can look at each fruit and see how it works. But the overarching principle is, is that when deliverance takes place, what we're doing is we're willfully rejecting the sinful nature of the enemy. We're making a conscious decision to say no. Y'all remember the Just Say No campaign from many, many years ago, right? Daily, what God is saying to us, just say no. The enemy's going to keep coming back because he's house shopping, y'all. In these last and evil days we in, he's house shopping like never before. Because he's trying to take as many people out of here with him going the wrong direction as he possibly can because he knows that the time is short. He knows the time is short, which is even more so why we've got to make up our minds to accept the nature of Jesus Christ. And we got to own the characteristics of Christ. I didn't say rent them. I said own them, which means we got to make a fundamental shift in our thinking. 
because one of the things I was making mistake, made the mistake of for a long time, and I made the mistake of it until my dad transitioned out of here. I would tell people all the time, I'll be content. You know, I'm half the man my father was. I'll be happy with that. I'm half the man my father was. I'll be happy with that. It took Father, took, took Holy Spirit to correct me. Lord spoke and said, no, that's incorrect. You are the man that your father was and then some. Because the same heart that beat in him is now the heart that beats in you. And on top of the heart that now beats in you that was once in him, I've now taken the gifts and talents and graces that I put in you and added them to what your father had, which makes you more than he was, which is not giving you license to be prideful, but it's giving you reason, God says, to praise me because now you can be an even greater impact in the earth to build upon the legacy that your father left. And that's what God desires us to do. He desires us to build upon the legacy that's still here in the earth that our elder brother Jesus gave us access to six hours one Friday that we made the decision to inherit when we said yes to him, but the enemy tried to get in the way. But when we got our minds and stuff clear through deliverance, now we got to set our minds back on what we're supposed to be doing, which is why to gain permanent benefit from deliverance, our temples have to be filled and stay filled with the characteristics of Christ. And that's done through abiding in him. And I want to walk through abiding real quick because our time is almost gone. When we abide, that word simply means to remain. So we're rescued ultimately to remain. Amen. We're rescued to remain. Pastor, what do you mean? We're rescued because we were in over our head. And we were rescued with the intent of remaining with the one that rescued us. Because in the presence of the one that rescued us, there's fullness of joy. In the presence of the one that rescued us, there's strength, there's peace, there's hope forevermore. Even in your down times, there's still an upside because Jesus is always the upside. My boss, pretty much every time I call my boss, you know, I'll call, you know, she'll say, Sir Thomas, what's good? My response is always Jesus. Jesus is good. God is always good. There's nothing I can tell you that's better than him. There's nothing I want to tell you because there's nothing better than him. What's good? God is good. Because he's good all the time. Even if I'm having what the world might deem as a bad day, guess what? God is still good. If for no other reason I'm here to say, guess what? You might view it as me having a bad day, but I view it as me having a glorious day because I'm still alive to tell you that God is good. That's the mindset that we have to have. Because when we have that mindset, what it does, it brings to the forefront what Jesus said right here, right after he said what the fruit is. He said, abide or remain in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides or remains in the vine, neither can you unless you abide or remain in me, which means you can't do this on your own. There's no such thing as a renegade saint. You show me a branch out there that can live being disconnected from its vine that it came from, and I'll show you a branch that's breaking every code of natural law. We weren't designed to be independent contractors in the spirit. We weren't designed to work with but via independent action, like it says here, or self-effort. We were designed to remain. We were rescued to remain. We were rescued from the methods of the enemy to remain in the presence of the Lord. Because it's in the presence of the Lord that there's fullness of joy. It's in the presence of the Lord that we get wise counsel. Because as we do that, that means we got to do something. That means we got to stay in fellowship with him. We got to stay in prayer. And most importantly, we got to stay in Bible study, amen? Because the word says, says, study to show yourself approved unto who? Unto God, right? A workman that needed not be ashamed, rightly divine, the word of truth. You know why that's important? I'll give you a hint. It's up on the screen. 
It's important because not only does it make our relationship with Christ stronger, but those that were here to talk about the full armor of God, if you look at the full armor of God, everything that we have in that armor is defensive except for one thing. What's that one thing? The sword of the spirit, right? Sword of the spirit, which is what? The word of God, right? And remember I said the way that you get better at using your sword is by doing what? By wielding it, right? You got to use it, right? So as we spend time with him and study, not only does it strengthen our relationship with him, which makes us want to remain with him, but it also sharpens our skills with our sword of the spirit as we learn to retain more scripture to add to our arsenal. It makes us more deadly to the enemy because the more scripture we know, the deeper we can cut. The more areas we can cut into, the better we can defend. The more potent we become to the enemy, even more so we put ourselves as a nemesis to the enemy. And you ain't escaping me, not today. Sickness, you're not escaping. You're going down today because my Bible tells me by his stripes, I am healed. Oh, you want to be resistant to that one? Okay, try this one on. He said his word and he healed him. Oh, you still reeling a little bit? Okay, fine. It, Healing is the children's bread. And because I'm his son, guess what? It's my birthright. Get out of here with that. You find yourself knowing Holy Spirit will bring to your members more than just one scripture. Scriptures that you didn't realize in your, in your logos that you had. But because he poured it in you through rhema, through inspired word, Holy Spirit brings back to your remembrance what it is that you need when you need it. But you got to have a relationship with him. That's the significance of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the ambassador. He speaks both languages. So deliverance is a weighty proposition. But as this series is sought to show you, it's not something that to be scared of. It's not something to run away from. In fact, it's something to run towards and embrace because it's a component of what we as saints are supposed to be doing as part of, 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 of doing the Great Commission. We're supposed to be ushering people into the presence of the Lord. Not everybody's going to come willingly. Some that come are going to be coming because of battle. While somebody wants them to come, somebody else wants them not to. Holy Spirit will help us identify when battles like that are going on, he'll equip us to do what we need to do. So if you remember nothing else from this series, please remember what you see right there. Because Jesus is saying that there comes a time when each of us had better put some positive things in our lives. There must always be a balance between positive and negative factors. And after the flesh is crucified and the demons are cast out, what we've got to do is put Jesus, we've got to put Jesus in his place and let him rule our lives by being filled with his purity and power. So when the question is raised with what do you fill your temple? Fill it with Jesus, amen. Because when you fill it with Jesus, the enemy comes back, he's like, oh, I can't go in there. Mm -mm, nope, they have, they have prayer meeting up in there. I can't go in there. They have a Bible study up in there. I can't go in there. They're casting out us in there. I can't go in there. That's how you guarantee the enemy can't come back. Make sure your temple is well lit. Make sure your temple is fully furnished. Make sure your temple is making a joyful noise to the Lord. Make sure that your temple is in a constant state of worship. You have the capacity to control that because it's your temple. You have the capacity to set your individual seal on the character of your temple. Don't ever forget the importance of character in your temple because every temple has it, amen. And when it's done over right, that's how you make and get an extreme makeover. Temple edition, amen. Amen, amen, amen. Truly we thank and praise God for. Living Witness Ministries is a church on the move dedicated to spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ through the preached and taught word, community activism and outreach, and practical ministry designed to meet needs, save souls, bless hearts, and transform lives. You can sow into Living Witness Ministries via Cash App at dollar sign LW Ministries 2020, Tithely or Givelify at Living Witness Ministries LaGrange, Illinois, or Zelle at living to witness at gmail.com. 
sow your seed into the good ground of Living Witness Ministries today. And thank you for helping us reach the world with the life-giving word.